Okay, it looks like we've pretty well stabilized on participants, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good evening, this is uh, Tom Logan. I'm chairman of the Board Conservation Committee, and I wanna welcome all of you to tonight's webinar. Uh, it looks like from the names that I see that most of you are members, so you know that uh, this is season two of Fly Fishers International Online. This is a series of webinars in its second season that Patrick Berry, our president and CEO, uh, started last winter to, uh, sorry, excuse me, I believe in the spring to uh, uh, make more connection with members, especially under the circumstances of the virus and us not being able to meet one-on-one -on -one in, in the many venues that we typically have. So again, welcome tonight. Uh, our topic tonight is, uh, or the focus of our webinar tonight will be conservation. Uh, the purpose of these webinars generally is to share as much information as we can in this venue with our members and, and other fly fishers who we consider to be part of our community. Uh, we hope that uh, you find these topics that we discuss of interest. Uh, they certainly are to uh, me, especially tonight. And then ultimately, we hope this information uh, proves to be of value to you and either your improvement of your casting, your fly time, uh, application to uh, fly fishing, and ultimately, we hope it contributes to your uh, expanded enjoyment of fly fishing in general. As I said, the focus tonight is conservation. We'll be talking about black bass diversity and conservation. There are a couple people that I want to introduce before I introduce our speaker for tonight. Uh, Jake uh, McLaughlin is, is on in, in the background. Jake is responsible for uh, the postings you've seen of this webinar and others and is on tonight to help with any technical problems that we, uh, we may encounter that I may create myself, as a matter of fact. Dave Peterson, our, our board chairman, also is on tonight. As you know, he uh, is our past uh, chairman of the Conservation Committee, certainly interested in our conservation work, uh, quite passionately and has agreed to help me tonight by monitoring questions you are able to ask by typing into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. So be aware that you can ask questions by typing them in. Dave will be monitoring them and we'll, uh, we'll address as many of the questions as we can at the end of the program tonight. With that, I would like to introduce the program. The program is Black Bass, their diversity, conservation, and we'll probably talk a little bit about fly fishing opportunities at the end. Obviously, our interest is fly fishing of black bass. The authors of this presentation are Mike Trindale, Tringali, excuse me, and Brandon Barthel. Uh, both of these fellows are uh, fishery scientists with my former employer, the Fish and Wild, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission here in, in Florida. So it, uh, it is especially uh, delightful for me to be hosting this webinar tonight and introducing Brandon Barthel, who is uh, going to be our presenter for the program tonight. So Brandon, Thank you very much for being with us tonight, and we look forward to your program. You have the floor. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Um, I really appreciate the invitation to talk about black bass. Uh, it's something that we are very passionate about. And I also wanna thank Jake for, for the technical work to, to make this happen. Appreciate his assistance as well. Um, so I'm gonna start my presentation here. So yes, I, I work for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, and specifically my supervisor, Mike Tringali, and I are part of the agency that is conducts research. We're the Fish and Wildlife 
Research Institute. And we're both part of the genetics lab, which is centered in St. Pete's, St. Petersburg, Florida. And we work on a, a wide array of fish and animal species. Um, but my particular purview is freshwater fish. And th this program working in on freshwater fish started about 13 years ago. And the focus was at that point was, was black bass. And we've worked on some other types of species since then. But because they are such a popular sport fish, that's what got the whole program started. And uh, ultimately that's what got, brings me here today. Um, so there are six black bass species in Florida, all of one of which are native, and we've done genetic work on all of them. Looks like Brandon may have just frozen up. I think we just lost Brandon. Well, um, folks, I apologize for the food paw that is occurring right now, but it does appear that uh, we've lost Brandon for some reason or another. Um, Tom, um, Jake just left a message that to stay on here, he's gonna try to reconnect with him, I believe. Okay. Okay, so everybody uh, certainly uh, stay tuned. We'll try and get this fixed. Uh, one, one other thing that I think you're all aware of, at least those of you who are members of Fly Fishers International, is that all of these webinars are, are only possible uh, with the, the support that you provide through your membership. So membership in FFI uh, certainly is important in many ways, uh, the least of which is uh, the, the uh, production of these webinars and the information we're able to share. And I have uh, a message from one of our participants. I teach online uh, welcome to my world. Then Brandon is back. Yeah, okay, Brandon. Okay, was that anyone that dropped out? You had just yeah, started. Just start. Okay, <laughs> hopefully it doesn't happen again. Maybe I'll try to go a little quicker uh, to get through this. Um, okay, here, I'm going back into the presentation. Okay. So I don't know how far I got before before I dropped out, but so we are we are part of the research institute within the state agency that that is responsible for fish and wildlife management in Florida, and my group works on freshwater fish, and it started to work on black bass, and that's most of the work we do till to today is is work on black bass. Uh, there are six black bass species in Florida. Uh, we've all but one of which are native. One is introduced. And we've done genetic work on all of them. And due to the recent interests in these rarer black bass species, there's been opportunities to get together with, with folks from other parts of the country, other states that have different species and, and talk about um, similar issues, uh, things like that. And I'm not an expert on the species outside of Florida, but I know, hopefully I know enough to at least get you guys an introduction on, on what they're about and where they are and what they do. I also should, acknowledge and admit that I'm not a fly fisher myself. Um, so any questions related to flies or, or, or fishing techniques, I'm gonna have to rely on Tom to address those. Um, but I can at least tell you where those fish, where the fish are and what they eat and hopefully that, that gets you started. And I imagine there's plenty of uh, resources online as well. So I'm gonna start this talk with some general information on black bass diversity 
And then I'm going to go through each of the species and tell you a little bit about each one. So what is a black bass? They're a, a group of freshwater fish. Uh, they're all part of the same genus, Micropterus, that is part of the sunfish family. And they may not look a lot like sunfish, but they share a common ancestor. Now there are currently 16 species, all of which are native to North America, and in fact, Eastern part of North America, uh, east of the Rocky Mountains. But because they are popular sport fish, they've been moved across the world and can there are black bass in every continent other than Antarctica at this point. They inhabit a wide range of freshwater environments, um, rivers, streams, anything basically you can think of. Uh, as long as the water's not too cold, there's gonna be a black bass in it most likely. And they're top predators in many of the environments and their aggressive feeding behaviors is, makes them extremely popular sport fish. So this figure is just showing the number of black bass species that have been recognized through time. And you can go back and you look at 1802 was when the first two species were, were described, largemouth bass and smallmouth bass. And then for the next almost 200 years, a range between two and seven species until 1998, when the shoal bass was described. And from that point on, we got a large number of species being acknowledged, recognized in the wild. And this is partly due to genetic techniques beginning to be applied to black bass taxonomy and, and, and research. Um, but it's also due to people just starting to pay more attention to these, these smaller black bass and some of these smaller systems. Uh, these fish were always there. People just hadn't been looking for them uh, until relatively recently. And part of that is due to this idea that they're historically, the, a lot of the focus has been on big bass. You know, you have fast bass boats that get you the best fishing spots. You have uh, tournament weigh-ins where people are trying to catch as many big bass as they can. And, and finally, you know, you, you get the big lunker to, to mount and stick on your wall. So for a long time, that was kind of the dominant idea in, in bass fishing. But more recently, I think there's been a, a more attention paid to diversity where people are getting out, you know, into native natural environments to catch fish that exist, these unique species. Um, not necessarily trying to get the biggest one, just trying to get one or, or multiple fish of these different species within the environments in which they exist. And one way this has uh, progressed is through these, this idea of a bass slam, where anglers are rewarded for catching uh, multiple species, a certain number of black bass species within a certain period of time. And these programs have been created and, and put forward by different state agencies, as well as bass angling groups like BASS. And then of course, uh, Fly Fishers International has the Bass Catch program, which is, which is more or less a very similar thing. And on the scientific side of thing, you know, people, the scientists are also trying to catch up and learn as much as they can about these unique species. Um, very recently. So, so the cover you see on the left is actually uh, the cover of a, a black bass diversity book that was published in 2015. And that was created by, um, was produced after a bunch of scientists got together to talk about, the, you know, black bass diversity, the different species that exists uh, across the, this group of fish's range at a scientific symposium. And they took those presentations and they, they turned them into a book. Um, and that's a big step forward, getting all that information together. And on the right is just a, a paper that kind of summarized the advances, the recent advances in black bass diversity that, have, that came out a few years later. So currently there are 16 species of black bass, 13 of which are described, and three of which are considered provisional, meaning that there's a lot of evidence that they are good scientific species, but they just haven't been fully described scientifically yet. And you can see these, these illustrations on the right. Um, all the black bass share, share a pretty common body shape. Uh, the color patterns differ a lot. And there are, there are some different morphological uh, uh, traits that you can see between them. But um, they're, they're all very similar in, in body shape and kind of what they do in the environment. And I want to acknowledge that these illustrations are, are all from Joseph Talmulary, who uh, some of you are, are probably familiar with, probably my mind, the greatest uh, fish illustrator there is, and I really want to acknowledge the fact that he allowed us to use these in the presentation. We were really grateful for him uh, allowing us to do that. 
So these maps show the, the native distributions of these black bass species in America, in the United States, in Canada. And you can see some of these species are very widely distributed. So for instance, the largemouth bass up here in green has a very wide distribution, smallmouth bass as well. And then you have other species that are just a segment of a single river system uh, in the Southeast of the United States. So there's quite a bit of difference in how, how distributed they are, the distributions. And um, one thing I do want to point out, though, is a lot of the diversity, a lot of these species are found in the southeastern United States. Mo most of the diversity exists there. Um, and this, this explanations related to this are, are, are largely due to geology and nice ages and fish being kind of isolated within single river systems and then evolving. But you can see in many cases, uh, these, there's one or two river systems that have a, a one species of bass, then you move over and there's a different species of bass right next door in the next stream. So in my mind, there are four species that I would consider the common species based on their, their wide distribution and their popularity with anglers. Um, here on the left, you have the largemouth bass and the Florida bass. In the center, you see a, a smallmouth bass. And on the right, you have the spotted bass. And if the Florida bass is, is just, uh, its range is here, you can see in this yellow area, but I included it as one of the common species because until recently, most people considered it to be a, a subspecies of largemouth bass, and it, it's very popular with anglers. So I'm going to talk about each of these common species. So um, starting with the largemouth bass, this is the, the black bass with the white distribution, and it has generalist habitat requirements that allow it to survive in most any freshwater habitat. And they naturally occur in the Mississippi River Basin, the Great Lakes Basin, and a number of smaller Gulf and Atlantic drainages. So in these maps that you're gonna see throughout the presentation, the native range is highlighted in yellow and then the gray areas are where they've been introduced. So you can see the largemouth bass has been spread very widely and it didn't take long for that to happen. By the 1890s, largemouth bass had been introduced to every, every state west of its native range. And these, these um, stockings, the movement of these fish out of their native range was primarily to uh, create fishing opportunities because they, they were considered such a great, uh, I guess at that point, a food fish and a sport fish, um, but people wanted them in, across the country. So large oil bass can thrive in lakes, rivers, reservoirs, and even salt marshes where there's you know moderate salinity. Um, they tend to choose areas out of strong current and rivers and streams and are most abundant in warm water water, bo water bodies with lots of structure. These fish are opportunistic predators that consume prey from all parts of the water column. And under the right conditions, they can reach very large sizes. So I put the world record up here. You can see near the top, 22 pounds. And there is an asterisk on that because that fish was caught in Georgia. And Georgia is an intergrade zone where the largemouth bass and the Florida bass uh, naturally hybridize. So it's very likely that um, that individual that is considered the world record very well could have been a hybrid between the two, but it's in the record books either way. And you know, it, it's this species is, is such a um, has is, is um, so adaptable it does not face any widespread conservation issues throughout its range. Okay, I'm going to move on to the Florida bass, which is. Um, one of the two species that really got our genetics program going in, in Florida, our freshwater genetics from, uh, program. Now they're very similar to largemouth bass, but pure non-hybrid populations are only found in Florida south of the Suwannee River. Because these fish are adapted to a warm subtropical climate, they grow to very large sizes and they've been stocked far and wide as well. Like largemouth bass, the Florida bass has generalist habitat and diet requirements, and they're very popular with anglers. And since the FWC, our agency, is responsible for all the pure Florida bass populations that, that exist, natural populations at least, uh, we have put in a, a number of regulations and um, rules to, to protect these populations in Florida. Okay, the next species I'm gonna talk about is the smallmouth bass, and it's native to the Northern Mississippi River Basin in the Great Lakes. And just like the other two species I talked about, they've been stocked widely across North America and in the globe. 
Um, they, they thrive in, in lake and reservoir environments, but compared to the, the largemouth bass and the Florida bass, the smallmouth bass is more of a river fish. It's more comfortable in flowing water, can often be found in riffles and behind boulders and river and runs, whereas you know the Florida bass and the largemouth bass would be back in the pools. Um, they're opt opportunistic feeders, consume fish and crayfish as adults, and they often stay near the bottom of the water column looking for their prey. Uh, again, this is a very adaptable species that does not face any widespread conservation threats. So while the, the smallmouth bass is native to the upper Mississippi River drainage, the spotted bass is, is located in the southern Mississippi basin. And they are, as well as some streams in Texas, and they too have been stocked outside their range. They are generalist both in terms of habitat requirements and diet, they thrive in reservoirs and medium to small size streams where they're more likely to be associated with areas of flow than largemouth bass, kind of similar to smallmouth bass in that extent. Similar to the other common species, they do not face any serious conservation threats. Okay, so those are the big boys. Now we're moving on to the, the rare species. And these species are not rare in terms of their abundance within their, their range and their habitats. You know, they're kind of described as rare because they don't exist in many places. Oftentimes their ranges consist of one river drainage or a handful of streams. Um, these are also species that have been recognized over the last several decades in most part. So, so there is some cases that biological information is limited. And these species exist from the Gulf Coast of Texas, here the Guadalupe bass, all the way to the Savannah River, the Bartram's bass, and uh, most places in between. Um, some of them are restricted to upland sections above the fall line. So here you see in the, the map on the right, these species all are above the fall line. They, they tend to be in the um, upland streams and not in the coastal plains sections of these river systems. But others, most of these on the left, are kind of find, found more throughout these river systems. So I'm gonna move from west to east, talking about these remaining, uh, these rarer black bass species. And if it, if it uh, to kind of help you, everybody stay oriented and where these species exist, I, I put this map in the upper right hand corner and I'll kind of highlight the, the part of the southeast we're talking about for each species. So the first one is the Guadalupe bass. And this is only found in a small number of rivers in central Texas. Uh, many of these streams originate in springs and the Guadalupe bass can be found in both the spring fed portions and the more turbid sections downstream. These fish do not get very large. The world record is less than four pounds, but the small size helps them thrive in these smaller streams where they are often associated with boulders, rocks, and other in-stream structure. They consume insects, crayfish, and fishes as adults. And I've heard there's a pretty popular uh, fly fishing fishery for them in the Edwards Plateau of Central Texas. Now this is a, a species with a pretty limited range um, you know, it's, it's only found in a handful of, of these river systems. And Guadalupe bass in many portions of its range were severely threatened by hybridization with introduced smallmouth bass. In the 1970s, Texas parks introduced smallmouth bass to try to create a, a, a fishery that didn't exist in this area. And it turns out that smallmouth bass and Guadalupe bass hybridize and they mate together and create hybrid offspring very readily. And this was gonna start to cause major problems where people became concerned about some of these populations being lost. And so Texas has developed and continues to operate a, a very, um, very large Guadalupe bass restoration program where they are raising Guadalupe bass in hatcheries and release them back in some of these rivers to try to make sure that these, the Guadalupe genes aren't kind of washed out of these populations by the smallmouth bass. And that's, that's been pretty effective in many cases, but it's been a lot of work for them as well. Okay, next is the Alabama bass. And these were considered a subspecies of spotted bass until 2008, so not that long ago. But they are, based on genetics and some morphology, they're clearly a distinct species. They only naturally occur in the Mobile Delta, which you see highlighted in yellow here. And it, and it covers most of Alabama, so it's, it's a big river system. Uh, they get larger than Guadalupe bass, you know, the up to eight or nine pounds. 
And unlike some of the other quote unquote rare black bass, bass species, they have general habitat requirements and do well in both medium to large rivers and reservoirs. They're more adaptable. And we'll talk about how this has actually led to some problems for other species a little bit later in this, in this talk. Um, fish are the primary prey and they're aggressive feeders and strong fighters when hooked by anglers. So they are pretty popular with anglers, uh, which also explains why they've been moved to other places. They don't face any uh, serious conservation challenges themselves, but they have been creating problems by hybridizing with other black bass species after they've been introduced outside of their range. So we're, we're staying in the same river system. We're still in the mobile uh, drainage, Mo mobile basin. But now we're gonna talk about four species that are found in the upland section of, these, of this river system. And up until 2013, these are all considered to be one species, the red-eye bass. But then a paper came out that actually said there's actually four species present within this area. And you know, all each of these species, these newly described species, occurs in one of the streams that flow together to create the mobile tensaw drainage. So these are all connected hydrologically, but the idea is that these species don't move down into these lower sections. They only stay in the upland areas and that has allowed them to remain isolated and, and be distinct. And these are a smaller set of species as well. Um, they, you know, the three and a half pounds is about as big as they get, but they are popular and in the areas they exist. They've actually been referred to as the brook trout of bass. Uh, they're found in these smaller upland streams, uh, often cool water, kind of in between where you would have trout living and, and then other species like largemouth bass and Alabama bass. Um, they're often oriented around rocks and structure and, and clear water and uh, current waters. Uh, they, they don't stay away from currents. They, they get in there and, and are in amongst the rocks. Um, they are primarily feed on terrestrial insects in the summer, and they also consume aquatic invertebrates, crayfish, salamanders, and smaller fish. And they're intolerant of reservoirs. These are river fish. Um, so when some of these rivers are impounded to create reservoirs, that has negatively affected some of them. Um, they also have some evidence of them hybridizing with other black bass species as well. Okay, moving a little bit further east, this is the Choctaw bass. And this is a species that has been discovered by our lab within the last uh, 10 years. And we're currently working on describing it. Um, it's, it's only found in these five rivers in the Western Panhandle of Florida and Southern Alabama. These aren't very big rivers, um, but it's a species that, again, it's, it's a river fish. It's often located near currents and structure, you know, log jams or, or um, um, tree roots along the side of a, a swiftly, uh, swiftly flowing section of the stream, uh, you often find Choctaw bass. And we haven't conducted a diet analysis, but I expect it's likely to include fishes and crayfishes. And, and the reason that this is, is a, a recently discovered species, I, I describe it as that, is that until we genetically identified it as being distinct, it was considered to be a spotted bass. Uh, they look pretty similar morphologically. And, I mean, if you, if you held them right next to each other, you could probably tell the difference, but they were close enough that until recently people thought they were spotted bass, but clearly they are not. So uh, this one is close to our hearts as, as one of our, as a species we are just have discovered and currently describing. Um, so they're a pretty cool little river fish. Okay, shoal bass. This is Another species that's native to a single river system, in this case, the Apalachicola drainage. And the Chattahoochee River is the largest tributary within the system. Uh, you can see here it flows from uh, northeast, uh, northwest Georgia, down along the border of Florida and Alabama, uh, Georgia and Alabama, and empties out in the Apalachicola River in Florida. And unfortunately, the Chattahoochee River is, is a series of dams, I believe there's 12 dams that have been constructed in the main stem of the river. And that's led to a, a loss of a lot of the river habitat that these fish have used in the past. Um, these fish are very intolerant of reservoirs and lakes. 
these are river fish as well. So currently in the, in the Chattahoochee River, they can only be found in the uppermost undammed portion of the Chattahoochee and in a section near Atlanta where they are stocked. But the rest of the Chattahoochee either has some remnant populations that may or may not exist. It seems like the areas that people thought there were populations in the past have kind of been disappearing over time. Um, but yeah, they're basically just holding on to the upper section of the Chattahoochee. Now the Flint River is a different story. The Flint River is largely undammed. That's the, the river section you see kind of running through the central part of Georgia there. And because there aren't but a few dams in there, um, the shoal bass are doing very well in the Flint River. You can find them in many places throughout the Flint River. Now in Florida, there's a single population that exists in the Chipola River, which is a tributary of the Apalachicola. And these, these fish are in um, 15 mile section of river, and that's the only place they exist in Florida. And we've done quite a bit of work on the shoal bass population, the Chipola River. It's, it's dealt with some hybridization and other issues. So we're, we're, we're doing our best to make sure it remains healthy through time. And, but, but to get back to the biology, these are, these are river fish that are very popular with anglers. Um, they're specialists that require rocky shoal habitat to survive and reproduce. They're often found in areas of swift to moderate current within these huge shoals that stretch across entire rivers. You can kind of see in this picture uh, in the lower right, these, these rocky shoals that can cross entire sections of river and, and sometimes you know, can be a hundred yards long. Um, shoal bass are in amongst those rocks in these areas, which makes them particularly uh, fun fish to, to try to catch. Um, a lot of times people wait for them, I know, um, in these shoal habitats. And I think there's quite a bit of a, a fly fishing, you know, you can find guide services throughout Georgia. People are very interested in catching shoal bass and it sounds like it's quite a lot of fun to catch them in their native habitats. Uh, they feed on crayfishes and fishes and have become extremely popular. Um, yeah, they're just a really cool fish. Unfortunately, within all three of these streams in which they currently find, they are experiencing hybridization. So in the Chattahoochee, they're hybridizing with Alabama bass, spotted bass, and smallmouth bass, none of which are native to that river. They've all been introduced. In the Flint River, there's Alabama bass and spotted bass that are hybridizing with shoal bass, not to the extent that it's happening in the Chattahoochee, but they are, it's present. And actually in Florida, in the Chipola, the shoal bass were hybridizing with um, Choctaw bass, which aren't supposed to be in that river. Um, they're actually in the Choctaw Hatchie River, which is you know right next door drainage wise. But uh, there was a little bit of a scare when we started seeing hybrids there, but it appears like it, it's knock on wood that maybe it's something that happened. People might have released a few fish in the river and then, then those fish you know lived their lives and died and, and hopefully things are gonna go back more or less to normal. Um, so that's a concern with shoal bass because they are such a popular fish, sport, sport fish now. Um, there's a lot of concern about hybridization and, and how it will affect these populations. So uh, the next next species is the Chattahoochee bass, which is also within the Apalachicola River system, but it's only found in the upper Chattahoochee River basin, upstream from Columbus, Georgia. Um, you know, again, this is a river that is been uh, altered considerably by damming, people creating impoundments, which perhaps has restricted its range. So it's it's now just in the uppermost portion of the Chattahoochee River. These are smaller fish. They can reach 10 to 16 inches. Um, but much like the red-eye bass, you know, they're, they're in these fast flowing sections of river, smaller streams and rocks and, and structure. And it sounds like they're quite a lot of fun to catch too, if you can, can find out where they are. And and within some of this, some of the areas of their now kind of reduced and smaller range, they're dealing with hybridization as well. All right, another Florida species, the Suwannee bass, and I think Tom has some experience fishing for, the, for them in Florida. Um, they are only found in, in four river systems that are kind of in the pan, panhandle and the Big Bend area of Florida and into Georgia. There are small to medium-sized black bass. Um, historically, they were only known to occur in the Ocklockney and Suwannee rivers, but then in the 1990s, 
people started seeing them in the St. Marks and Wasissa rivers. So there's been speculation that they might have been introduced by anglers. This wasn't done by the, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. But regardless, they seem like there's healthy populations in, in four streams now rather than two. Uh, it's, it's Again, it's a river fish that's intolerant of reservoirs. There's a Lake Talquin is a major reservoir in the Ocklockney River. There are Suwannee bass above and below it, but not within it. They just will not live in, in uh, outside of these river systems. It's found in spring-fed streams and often associated with moderate to swift currents, uh, often oriented to woody debris and dense aquatic vegetation. And they are crayfish eaters to the extent that people have speculated that crayfish abundance is linked to Suwannee bass abundance. You know, if, if you have a river that doesn't have many crayfish, you're probably not gonna have many Suwannee bass, at least that's what I've heard. So they're one of the, the good cases where there's a rarer black bass species that does not currently uh, experiencing hybridization with any other species so far. And that that's largely, probably largely due to the fact that there haven't been any of these, these other species introduced to these rivers, um, which is a great thing. You, know, you never know what's gonna happen when a species is introduced outside its native range, what's gonna to happen to these other endemic black bass species, but so far so good for the Swanee bass. Okay, um, now I'm gonna talk about the Altamaha bass, and this is a relatively recent uh, species that is currently being described, so there's not a lot of information on it. Um, again, it's in the upper section of the Akmogi, Akoni, and Ogeechee rivers in Georgia. Similar to the red-eye bass, you know, it's, it's in these swiftly flowing stream sections with around these, these rocks and, and other structure. They don't get very large, 12 to 16 inches. Um, the, the diet, as far as I know, has not been studied, but, you know, again, it's likely to be very similar to red-eye bass. But these are hybridizing with non-native Alabama bass that have been introduced to these river systems. Okay, and then the last one I'm going to talk about is the Bartram's bass, which is currently being described as well. Uh, similar size to the red-eye bass and the Altamaha bass, you know, 12 to 16 inches. And these are only found in the Savannah River drainage upstream of Augusta, Georgia. Um, possibly they've been introduced to some tributaries of the Santee Basin as well. Uh, it's found in rocky areas with flowing water and feeds on terrestrial and aquatic insects as well as crayfish and small fishes. And unlike these other um, riverine species, um, these rarer riverine species, it seemed like Bartram's bass were doing pretty well in the reservoirs that have been constructed in the, the Savannah River. Uh, it seemed like they were able to, to live in those habitats and, and do well. But uh, more recently, people have introduced Alabama bass and smallmouth bass who are even um, more tolerant of these reservoirs and it's led to hybridization so that now pure populations of Bartram's bass have kind of only been found in these upper tributaries of these river systems instead of being more distributed more widely as they had been in the past. So hybridization is a concern for, for Bartram's bass. And again, it's a species that's threatened by hybridization that has not even been fully described yet. So that's, that's a little disconcerting. Okay, so I've run through all the species. Uh, hopefully that wasn't too fast. But there are some general concerns, particularly for these rarer species that don't have wide ranges that aren't generalists. You know, if these rare species are habitat specialists, that means changes to their environment may have serious consequences to the population persist persistence. Um, even small things like you can see in the, the picture on the right in the middle, you see some cows on the bank of the river system. This is the Chipola River watershed. And these cows were able to, you know, go down to the river and to, to drink water. And they basically destroyed the shoreline to the effect that the silt, siltation that resulted from, from the, their alteration of that shoreline habitat was silting over some of the shoal habitat the shoal bass needed. Um, so people are, you know, now that people are thinking more about these rare black bass species, they can do things to try to mitigate things like that and help preserve the environment that these fish need to survive and thrive. And nearly all of the rare species are hybridizing with black bass species from outside their native ranges. In a few cases, this is a result of state agencies introducing fish. For example, in Texas, them introducing smallmouth bass intentionally into those Edwards Plateau rivers. But in most of these cases, it's, it's not a, 
um, it's not the agencies doing it, it's anglers themselves moving fish between river systems. And because there are so many black bass species in the southeast, you don't have to move a species very far to impact another native species in the, in the um, drainage next door or a couple over. And, you know, even though the, the Alabama bass is a species that's only found and only native naturally occurs in the Mobile uh, Basin, when it's introduced outside of that into these other systems, it's, it's turned out that they can have severe impacts on these rare species. They, they do very well in reservoirs and they also, you know, they're also adaptable enough to do well in rivers. That's where they, they evolve what they're adapted to in the Mobile drainage. So, you know, they get a little bit bigger they are a little bit more generalist in terms of their habitat requirements and their diet. And so when they're introduced outside their native range, they, they can really kind of take a big um, chunk of the habitat and hybridize with these, these native species and, and cause problems. So kind of the takeaway message for, for black bass conservation is that healthy populations require stable habitats and fish should never be moved outside their native ranges. Um, when it's happened in the past, it's, it's caused problems. So the best thing to do is, is catch them where they exist, enjoy that experience, and then put them right back where you caught them. Um, that way you have the memory, hopefully you have a few pictures, and uh, you won't be causing any problems for species in other parts uh, of the Southeast. So with that, that's what I've got. And if there are questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, thank you, Brandon. I've got about uh, 20 or 30 questions uh, myself that uh, I'd like to discuss. But before we get into those, um, first, uh, very good presentation. Enjoyed that very much. Uh, this very good information, certainly relevant to, as you pointed out, we do have a, a, a bass catch program that uh, is intended to uh, encourage our, our members to learn more about these different species, the habitats where they occur and, and do that while they, they fish for them. Uh, Dave, do you have some questions that have come in that uh, you'd like to ask? I sure do. Uh, excellent presentation, Brandon, thank you. I've got uh, several questions for you. Um, What's the latest thinking about the impact of bass fishing tournaments on the survival of the fish that are caught, kept in a live well and waded away in? That's, that's a good question. Um, it's somewhat outside of my area of expertise. Um, I'm a geneticist by training and I hear a little bit um, from the people that are more involved in the management side, but probably not enough to, to, to make a really educated statement. Um, it's kind of it's one of those things where there's there's such a huge demand, public demand for for those kind of experiences to occur, that I, I think people can try to find ways to to reduce the impact on populations. But yeah, to, to be honest, I, I'm really not sure what what the actual consequences, negative potential negative impacts are. So, okay, thanks. I'll have to leave it there. Uh, a second question. Is, is the tolerance of river fish to reservoirs or the lack thereof based on water temperature, oxygen content, or other factors? I think it's unknown in most cases. Uh, it could be all of those things. Um, possibly also that they're, they're so well adapted to that, that swiftly moving water, that environment, you know, that's, that's where they feed, that's where they spawn, that when they're taken out of that environment, they just, they just, don't know how to do the things they need to do to survive and persist. For, for example, shoal bass, these shoal habitats are, are important for feeding. That's where you know they're often caught. That's where they spend most of their time, but it's also where they spawn. Uh, in Florida, we had some researchers go out and, and try to study the spawning habitats of the shoal bass in the Chafola River. And they were going out and these fish were spawning right, right behind these boulders in the middle of the river where there was current on both sides. And they put these cameras out and it was pretty amazing to see how these fish were adapted to, it's not just the adults, but when the fry hatched and came off the nest, which they do, they, they kind of, it takes them a little while to learn how to swim and develop their swimming ability. You know, they, they would stay out of the current and remain in the nest until they were able to, to um, navigate and had the, the strength and the ability to, to take care of themselves. So it, it, may, be, it may be related to something like um, temperature. Um, rivers probably tend to be cooler than a lot of these reservoirs. 
but it, it also could be foraging and, and reproduction. Sometimes these species are so specialist in, in their requirements that um, they, they just don't know what to do if they don't have what they're looking for. And, and, and with shoal bass, people have, you know, released them into these reservoirs that exist in some of these um, systems. And then it's, they, you know, based on telemetry, I believe they, they just move out as soon as they can and just go back to the river. That's what they're looking for. So it's not like they, they stay there and die. They just seek out the environment they're looking for, which is probably probably true in most cases. They're just looking for that flowing water because that's what, they're, what they need to survive. I got a couple more for you here and then I'm gonna turn it over to Tom so he can get to his 20. Um, uh, on your last slide, uh, this viewer saw that the bass had lateral lines and long lines running vertical across the lateral lines at right angles. What do these lines do? <laughs> oh, um, so, I, so I think the, the, the coloration panel, the, the lines and the different color patterns probably have a couple purposes. Uh, one might be, you know, obviously to be a source of camouflage based on the environment they live in. It's probably important, maybe not as much for the, the uh, adults as for the juveniles, but also maybe for adults when they're, they're hunting uh, for prey. But in some cases, you know, these color patterns you see on these fish are related to, to mating where, you know, the, the male or the female are looking for particular color patterns on, on the, the fish they're mating for. And if they don't see that, then they, they don't, they, they don't recognize them as a member of a species as a potential mate. So that could be another thing that, that preserves these, these color patterns in time. I'm not entirely sure what that specific pattern was. Um, you know, with the black bass, there tend to be two major variations. You either have a, a, a lateral, a, a black stripe down the lateral line, which is common in a lot of cases, or you have those kind of bars that you see in shoal bass or and to a lesser extent smallmouth bass. But uh, the exact benefit of having those different color patterns, I, I'm not sure, but it could be related to survival and it could be related to, you know, attracting mates and that sort of thing as well. Okay, got one more for you here. Um, this panelist never realized there are so many species of bass and I think that applies to a lot of us. And, and their unique habitats. What is the future of all these species? Will they be hybridized a hundred years from now and there'll just be a couple of species with the extent of the hybridization you were talking about? Yeah. Boy, I hope not. Um, so, so in some of these systems, for instance, the Chattahoochee where there are now at least three non-native species that have been introduced into a severely altered hydrologic environment. So there's a system that used to be a river and now it's dammed. So it's a series, more or less a series of lakes, except for that upper portion, which is undammed. So, you know, these, these specialist species are, are not going to be able to go back into those dam sections and survive. They're gonna be restricted to the environments in which they can survive. And to the extent that it's possible, you know, these management agencies that are now aware of these species and, and thinking about their conservation, you know, when, once you have a species that you're promoting as part of a bass lamb or something like that, that to me, that suggests that you, you are thinking about their long-term benefit. They're important to you and you're, you're going to do what you can to pr protect them. So the idea is to try to limit the hybridization before it gets too far. Um, so in, in the instance, we, we, the situation we dealt with in the Chipola river, you know, we, we saw there was hybridization that was happening. We started monitoring it. We were, you know, getting samples every couple of years and we're using genetics to try to figure out how many fish were hybrids, how many were, what kind of hybrids they were, things like that. And then, you know, we started making plans that if it was, if it got too far, then we could do something similar to what Texas did, where you, you bring some adults to the hatchery, you spawn them out and you try to release them back into the wild to kind of swamp the non-native genes. Something like that can work if you prevent more introductions of the non-native species coming into that system. So you gotta, you gotta turn off the faucet so those non-native genes are no longer getting in and then you can kind of water them down using hatcheries. So, you know, things like that are possible in many cases, um, you know, the Chattahoochee, upper Chattahoochee, something like that seems plausible to me. 
But other cases like with the Bartram's bass, where the Alabama bass are kind of currently spreading widely throughout, as far as I know, the entire system, it's a species that does well in reservoirs and does well in the streams. It's going to be harder because it's a, it's a larger geographic area that you're concerned with. So, so people, I think people are going to do their best to try to find ways to mitigate these problems. But in some cases, it might not be enough. To, you might have just a few relic populations in some cases. But I don't want to be pessimistic. But at least now people are thinking about it, which is the first thing. You got to have people thinking about the problem and valuing the, the diversity that exists within their state. And then they can actually try to find a solution. Thanks, Brandon. Tom, turn it back to you. OK, thank you, Dave. Uh, Brandon, uh, one thought that I have is that uh, I, I don't believe Fly Fishers International and any of the materials that we have put together uh, have uh, addressed this hybridiz hybridization issue. Yeah, certainly not in black bass. We have another species, such as the salmonids. Uh, but as it relates to fishermen actually transporting black bass into systems where they, where the hybridization is occurring, this may be something that they, we could put together in some of our messaging. So I, I think I'd like to circle back with you and talk about that a little bit further off, offline and well. So I, I th but I do know there are some things that we could do in that area. One question I have, though, is uh, to actually two questions relative to the hybridization. Uh, obviously, um, these, these species and their habitats are pretty widely distributed collectively, and a number of states are involved. What, what level of uh, collaboration is occurring in addressing these biological issues? Uh, regulations with regard to uh, both catch as well as anglers transporting fish and you know and the, for whatever reasons that they would do that what what kind of collaboration is ongoing that would be beneficial to solving and minimizing some of these hybridization problems yeah um it's it's a tough thing to, to try to deal with um, because it's largely, in my mind at least, it's, it's a matter of educating anglers to get them to understand the consequences. Um, in most cases, I, I, people aren't, you know, it's not intentionally trying to do anything destructive, but in most cases, they're just not aware, probably. Um, they just think this, I like this fish that I catch in this river, it'd be cool if it was close to my house, I'm going to put it in this river. Um, so, you know, when we had these symposium, and, so, and we get all these people from different states together, people talk about different ways to address it. And, it, and it's, it's kind of a hard problem to get your arms around. I think the best we can do is, you know, as, to the extent possible, just get groups like yours and maybe when managers and people that are part of these agencies talk to anglers to try to share that message that, you know, hybridization is a problem. If you like catching bass, then you don't want to move them around because you're going to actually be destroying bass that you, you, without even knowing you're doing it. Um, in terms of collaboration, so so um, these scientific symposia kind of led to this uh, black, dot, uh, black Bass Initiative, which brought you know, people from out the managers and to some extent researchers across the Southeast to get together to talk about issues. But it wasn't so much, you know, trying to come up with regulations or, or a kind of a, a region-wide management plan or something like that. It was more to share um, issues that are affecting people in these different states and try to find common ground. And, and, and this is something that always comes up about keep not moving fish around. And, and hopefully, you know, as people become more aware that even that these species exist, that will become less of an issue all the time. Um, but it's, it's just not something that's kind of easy to do because it doesn't take many people to, to move fish around and cause a problem. Um, you know, one or two people can can kind of do that on their own, and then it takes a lot of work from a lot of people to to try to mitigate that and, and respond to it. So, well, not it very certainly important. starts with uh, with having the information and and getting it 
to out, out of the agencies, you know, out, out of the uh, discussions of the biologists and into the awareness of, of the people who are fishing for them, whether they're fly fishers, spin fishers, or otherwise. So uh, I think that's something that, that we might give more thought to. And of course, we have some conservation partners that we could share our thoughts with as well. So anyway, we'll, uh, we'll give more thought to that. Uh, one other thing that uh, I would uh, I wanted to ask about is, you know, given that you know we do need to know more about these species and their distribution and these issues that we've been talking about. Much of this information is certainly represented in in these this proceedings of of the symposium black bass diversity, and I and I know that. Uh, this book is <clears throat> available from the American Fishery Society. Uh, I believe also the, the species profiles that are in the beginning of the book are also available separate from the rest of the book. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So if you go to the American Fishery Society website, which I believe is fisheries.org, um, you, you can order the entire book, the hard, you know, the, the hardcover, copy of it, or you can order the entire book digital version, which I assume you just download right away, or you can uh, purchase the individual chapters. And the, the front part of that book are these species profiles, which might be the most interest. The rest of the book, you know, it, it is a science book. It's not written, it's not like a, um, a, it wasn't, it was written to be read by other scientists for the most part, uh, at least the, the, the research portion of the book. So I want to just caution people. It's not, it's not written for, your, uh, for a non-scientist to really to, to get a lot out of it, probably. Although if you're science oriented, you might. But the species profiles are very general. They have information, more or less the information that I presented, but in greater depth and more information. So yeah, those individual species profiles are available for digital purchase. And uh, it could help you know, anglers that before you go out and, and try to tackle a species that might give you some information by, by checking that out. Um, I should also point out that Georgia has a really, really good um, website. If you're looking to, to catch one of these rarer black species in Georgia, uh, check out their, their black bass slam page. There's a lot of information there, including maps telling you, you know, play, where, where to go and and to some extent, what to use. So I was really impressed with what Georgia had. So that's that's a free opportunity to get some more information if you're Certainly. thinking about fishing species Certainly. in Georgia. Okay, well, listen, Brandon, I think this has been uh, excellent. Uh, it certainly is of immense interest to those of us who are interested in black, black bass and the different species and where they live and so forth. We think so much about the different salmonids and where they are and these same types of issues that have been occurring. Uh, one thing that's uh, fascinating to me is uh, how many years ago uh, the translocation of fishes starting with the West Slope rainbows started after uh, we began to recover economically from the Civil War in, in the late 1800s. I, I did not think about the fact that uh, during those same periods uh, while we were moving rainbows east, that uh, we were moving black bass west as, as well. That's interesting. So mm -hmm. uh, you've given us a lot to think about, and we will be. And I think there's some things that uh, we can apply some focus to and perhaps help, help out on some of these issues. And we will. So I thank you very much. This has been very interesting interesting to us. Uh, again, thank you very much. I want to remind everybody that, uh, again, that uh, it's, it's our membership that make these uh, webinars such as this uh, possible. We have more, many more webinars. We have quite a few on, on uh, conservation topics. We'll have one on historic distribution of, of Arctic grayling next month. And uh, as context for a project that's occurring in Michigan to restore, restore the species. We have uh, webinars in uh, July, excuse me, January on, on Western rivers and their conservation, and another one on salmonids by our um, 
Leopold Award winner uh, for this year, Russ Thoreau, in February. So we've got some really good webinars coming up. Again, your support is very important to these. So those of you that are, are members, certainly continue to renew your membership. If you've got friends to bring in as new members, that's important. We all have a really important opportunity, and that's through our support to leave a legacy. Uh, leave a legacy for fly fishing, for conservation, and for ourselves as well. So again, Brandon, we, we thank you very much. And I thank all the rest of you, the participants who have joined us tonight. And I look forward to hosting uh, other programs for you in, in coming months. So good night, everybody. Thank you very much. Good night.